Many of you uh, have seen me present before, and in many cases, many of you are uh, familiar with some of the subjects that I have presented on in the past. And what you may not know, because this is something that I've started doing only fairly recently, is I've started calling myself a computational philosopher. What this means, basically, is it's combining two subjects that I have a lot of energy and emotion around, that is to say, that of computer science, that of being able to compute things and process things and so forth, but also that of philosophy and a lot of the related liberal arts. I will actually lump a large number of things under the umbrella of philosophy because philosophy in many cases is the root to a lot of the things that we currently uh, enjoy, study, talk about, etc. within the, well, within civilization, within everything, really. And it occurred to me uh, a couple of years ago that there was an interesting intersection between programming and psychology and philosophy. Now, it sort of occurred largely because of this picture. And some of you may have seen me use this picture before, because this is a problem that routinely shows up when we start talking to users, ordinary people, people who are not software technologists. And we use this as an analogy because when we get ready to work on a project and the boss comes to us and says, hey, I want you to work on a project, and you say, okay, great, I'm gonna go off and build a really quick throwaway prototype. I'm gonna build the doghouse there in the upper right corner. And the boss comes back and he looks at your project and says, oh my God, it's amazing. Ship it. You're like, wait, wait, no, no, no. This is a prototype, boss. You don't actually want to. No, 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 it looks great. Ship it. And now Project Doghouse is in production. And this probably will start causing flashbacks for some of you because you remember when you built that prototype and they put it into production. And of course, it was never designed to actually stay up for any length of time. And so it was constantly crashing and you were getting paged at two in the morning and so on and so forth to try to fix this thing that you had never really wanted to ship in the first place. So the next time the boss comes to you and says, hey, we want to start working on a project, you're like, aha, I know where you're going with this boss. You're going to take whatever I build and put it into production. Even though you call it a prototype, we're gonna take whatever I build and put it into production. So when the boss says, we wanna do a prototype for the marketing department, can you put something together by the end of next week? And you're like, sure, not a problem. So at the end of next week comes up and the boss comes to you and says, so how are we doing on this project? And you're like, well, boss, we've just finished iteration zero. We've decided which revision control system we're going to use. We've started to decide the languages that we're going to work on. We're going to build this as an event sourcing platform because we know what's going to need to scale. We're trying to decide which languages we're going to use. And the boss is like, time out. I just wanted you to build a prototype. And you're like, no, 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 no. I know what you said, but that's not what you wanted. What you wanted was a skyscraper, and so that's what I'm going to build for you. And the boss is like, no, 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 I just wanted a prototype. And how do two otherwise intelligent, reasonable human beings miss each other so hard? I mean, think about this for a second. If you were to bring your boss into this room and you were to show him a picture of these two buildings and say, are these two buildings the same? If your boss says yes, run. <laughs> most of them, because I firmly believe that most bosses are in fact rational thinking beings, most of them will say, well, yeah, no, those, are two, those two buildings are clearly not the same. One is something that we slap together with some lumber from the bargain bin at the local hardware store, and the other is clearly designed to house people for long periods of time, have places of business, possibly places of shopping, right? There are some skyscrapers that are now including grocery stores on certain floors and so on and so on and so on. And one of them, you know, is definitely not going to stand up to a strong rainstorm. The other one has to withstand earthquakes, tidal waves, anything Mother Nature can throw at it. And when you ask your boss, would you construct these two buildings the same way? Of course, he's going to say no. And yet, he can't tell the difference between a software prototype and something that you build for production. 
Because, as it turns out, software is an extraordinarily ephemeral thing. It doesn't exist in the real world. Take a moment right now, look around you, and please point to the software in the room. I mean, we've been talking about it for three days. We've been talking about these languages, we've been talking about these tools, we've been talking about these various places where the stuff can live, so therefore, it has to be here somewhere. Where is it? Interestingly enough, when we conduct this study with people who are non-technical people, do you know where they point? They point to the screen. They point to whatever screen they happen to be looking at. That, to them, is the software. Now, you and I know from long experience that that's not where the objects are. That's not where the functions are. That's not where the heap is, the threads. All of that is on the CPU. And so if we were to crack open the laptop there and we were to get a really, really strong microscope, because you know there's millions of them, right? We get a really strong microscope and we peer onto the CPU, what we see are objects, threads, right? We'll, we'll actually see the garbage collector come through and sweep up a few object, objects and cart it off over here to the side to make a little bit more room on the heap, right? We'll see these things moving around. It's just like Tron, right? Yeah, not so much. What we would actually see if we had a strong enough microscope is we would see energy pulses, ones and zeros, going really, really fast, right? And everything else, every single one of those pixels, everything that we interact with, everything that's happening is built on top of those ones and zeros through a whole bunch of abstractions. We build abstractions on top of abstractions, on top of abstractions, on top of abstractions, on top of abstractions, on top of abstractions. This just keeps going for as far down the stack as you care to go. It's all one abstraction on top of the other. And if we're going to deal with all of these abstractions, and bear in mind, there is no other industry that I'm aware of anywhere in the world that deals with as many and as many deep at levels of abstraction as we do. If you talk to the medical community, when they talk about the human body, they may talk about things that are really, really tiny and hard to spot, but at the end of the day, they're right there. There's cells, there's, there's, there's bacteria, there's hair, there's whatever, it's right here. It's physical, it's in the room. Even when you talk to politicians and justices about laws and legal and so forth, this is stuff about how we interact with one another, it's maybe one abstraction level removed. We're talking about the law itself. And maybe if you start talking about the process by which we draft laws, you could argue that maybe that's another level of meta. But how many layers of abstractions do we see in software? It's just there's no comparison to anything we've ever dealt with before in history. And because it's this extraordinarily ephemeral activity, because we are constantly dealing with abstractions, I mean, when you work on a car, you're right there, your hands are covered in grease, you're dealing with the engine, you can see what's working or what's not working. When you are sick and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, how are you feeling? You say, oh, doctor, I have a pain in my left arm, and <clears throat> I've got a cough. You are reporting how you feel directly to the doctor. When you try to debug software, what do you do? You don't walk up to the program and say, hey, how are you feeling? It'd be kind of nice if you could, right? No, instead, you talk to another software program and ask it how the first one is feeling. This is like taking your significant other to the doctor. And when the doctor asks, how are you feeling? She answers for you. How is he feeling? Well, he's got this little pain in your left, and you're like, ah, no, shut up, dear, we've got this. You just sit there. That doesn't 
always make sense unless you're married to her, and then it's completely legit, right? We can't observe software directly. We can't touch it, we can't manipulate it. It is all these abstractions upon abstractions upon abstractions upon abstractions. And the thought occurred to me as I was kind of going through this thought process, is there any other group that has really dealt with abstractions as much as we have? There are two such groups actually that deal with it. One is the philosopher. The philosophers going all the way back to the times of ancient Greece have been dealing with things they can neither see nor touch nor hear nor smell. And quite frankly, you can agree or disagree with some of what, what they've said, but they laid a groundwork. They laid a, a foundation, a groundwork for so much of what would come ever since. The other group that really has to deal entirely with abstractions are the psychologists, the people who really want to study the mind and behavior and so forth. If you think about it, we actually have a very deep rapport with psychologists because in both cases, you're trying to debug something you cannot see. In software, of course, we're trying to figure out why a particular software program did a thing. In psychology, we're trying to figure out why a particular person did a thing. And if you think that's not hard, let me ask you a simple question. What makes something funny? Seriously, what makes humor? Why do we laugh? What makes things funny? There's people who have actually spent a fair amount of time studying that particular subject, and they're not entirely sure, because the funny thing about the human brain is everybody's slightly different, and unfortunately, it's really hard to like reboot and start over. In some cases, I kind of wish we could. That'd be kind of cool, right? You know, if, if the brain were more like software, you could like hook up a debugger and watch what you were thinking, sort of see where you're starting to lead yourself down a particular path and say, oh yeah, no, 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 let's, let's fix that part right there. Cool, yeah, now I no longer have a fetish for pink unicorns. Don't know where that came from. Don't care, it's gone now. <laughs> kind of awesome. But we're not there yet. The psychologists and the philosophers have spent a lot of time thinking about abstractions. So, I went diving into philosophy and psychology. What exactly is philosophy? A lot of people have a lot of, of you know, impressions of philosophy. Most of the time it has something to do with dude with a toga standing here looking like this. Right? You have to look very, very philosophical if you're going to do philosophy. Usually with a, uh, like somebody holding grapes over your head while you do that. Right? A lot of dead Greeks from like 5,000 years ago involved here. The term itself comes from the Greek love of wisdom. And in many respects, it is the fundamental root of all thinking. One description of philosophy says that it has science in one hand and religion in the other. And in fact, um, it would not be unfair to suggest that the principal question that philosophy seeks to answer is the question, what is philosophy? And for most people, that's just like a, oh, geez, really? That's your, that, really? See, this is one of the hard things that people get really, really annoyed about philosophers, is they will ask questions and not know the answers. It's kind of like running into a room, dropping a stink bomb, and then running back out again. You know, ha ha, deal with this problem, I'm not gonna mess, Bye bye Interestingly enough, most of us already, to some degree, are amateur philosophers. If you have ever sat in a room and thought, geez, why am I here? Now, most of the time, when we think that, it's because you're working this really, really shit job, and you have for the last, like, six months, and you're trying to convince yourself that, yes, money is actually worth, you know, if I stay here and continue to, you know, do espressos or, or, you know, if I stay here and continue to mop toilet, you know, toilets or if I continue to write Perl code, eventually it will all be worth it. Eventually things will, will, you know, I'll get the money and I will then be happier about it. But we've all spent some amount of time thinking about, you know, what should I do? If you've ever agonized over a career decision, 
Should I stay where I'm at or should I go out and look for another job? What are the principal benefits? You start rationalizing how exactly to think about this. Well, do I want to do sort of a pros, cons thing? Or do I want to follow my heart? Or do I want, you're engaging in philosophy. You're engaging in the same act that people have been doing for about 5,000 years. And if you've ever sat in front of a computer screen, and if you've ever looked at a particular bug and said, is this really a bug? Isn't this exactly what the marketing guys asked for? Yes, no, how do I find out if this is a bug? Who do I ask? Who is the source of truth with respect to what defines a bug? And if it is a bug, then how do I know where this bug came from? What caused it? Where did it come from? How do I know that this information is in fact the same information that's residing in the database? How do I know that this is the same information that was typed in by the user? These are all, again, philosophical questions at their heart. There are five principal branches, metaphysics, epistemology, logic, moral philosophy, and political philosophy. And there's debate as to whether there are more branches than this, but a lot of people agree that it's basically relating back to these five. Epistemology, for example, is what you do when you're debugging. How do you know that this is a bug? How do you know that the information displayed is incorrect? How do you know that the information stored in the database is incorrect? Who decided this is a bug? Every programmer at some point in their career will be faced with a situation where they, they produce some software and it generates what somebody insists is the wrong answer. And you say, well, no, according to the spec right here, this is the correct answer. And the user says, no, I, t I guarantee you that's the wrong answer. Who's right? This is an epistemological question. You're searching to figure out what you know, how you know, why you know it, etc. Political philosophy is what a lot of people have been coming to recently in the space of a lot of the very surprising events that have occurred on the political landscape. How much control should a government have over its populace? How much control should the populace have over its government? A lot of people are weighing in a lot, uh, very strongly on that. And this has some interesting implications for us in the software space, which I'll get to later. Most people think about philosophy as moral stuff. What is the definition of good? What is the definition of evil? How should people respond to, eh, who cares? Boring, not interested. And most of us as computer science, we think about logic all the time. If this, then that, do this other thing, etc. Roger Scruton, who's a uh, interesting philosopher, he's got a nice summation that I like about it, where he says there are two distinguishing characteristics about philosophy. One is this notion of abstraction. We seek to abstract the problem away into a discussable form. Yes, we could certainly talk about all of creation, but we seek to abstract all of creation into some nicely discernible idea. The ancient philosophers, of course, started reasoning about the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, making up all of creation. Aristotle believed that the human body was made up of four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. That was basically what was going on inside. This is an abstraction, but it's a way to try to wrap our head around something that's much more ephemeral, much more abstract. The other is a concern for truth. We seek some notion of truthiness somewhere. And Scruton in particular, right, Problems of philosophy and the systems of design to solve them are populated in terms which tend to refer not to the realm of actuality, but to the realms of possibility and necessity. By definition, we're not talking about the actual world. We're talking about what could be, what might be, what necessarily has to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that's really, really important about philosophy, and this is something I think that we need to carry back into the realm of computer science. Students are encouraged not to accept the conclusions of their teachers, but to discuss, argue, and disbelieve. Merely because I stand up here and say, the world is flat. If you are sitting in a science class, and your teacher makes that assertion, there is an implicit bias, there is an implicit energy, an implicit effort 
that says you accept what the teacher has said because people have done those experiments, they have proven that the world is flat, and you should just accept that. In a philosophical classroom, that is exactly the opposite. As a student of philosophy, when somebody is teaching you something, when somebody is challenging you, your response is to challenge back. Well, how do we know that the world is flat? Well, you walk outside and look, see, flat. Okay, but if we extend on a high enough hill, is that still the same view, et cetera, et cetera? We're now engaging in philosophical discussions. But we don't get to just make stuff up. That's different. That we call politics over in America. You have to actually root your arguments in logic and reason. You have to have some fundamental ground rules here in place to be able to prove some of these things. Now, logic and reason can get us into trouble. We'll see that in just a second. But the key thing to understand is that most science, most of what we consider to be science, began as philosophy. The basic progression goes something like this. We begin with a question. What is fire? And people offer up some logic and reason and we start working with that, but then we start looking for ways to understand it more deeply. And eventually, that turns into chemistry. Because we start being able to understand, okay, well, these are atoms and this is energy and this is the transfusion of matter into energy. This is how things are beginning transformed. We start talking about the conservation of matter, so on and so forth. Philosophy has been at the root of every science ever. Physics, chemistry, Aristotle is referred to as the natural philosopher because he was the one that first basically walked outside and said, huh, it's raining, I wonder why that is, and started asking those questions. Now again, occasionally these exercises in philosophical thought can raise some really interesting questions that then Sometimes they don't have good answers, but the quest to find them is useful. One such is what's known as the Sorites Paradox. It started out as a discussion of grains of sand, but the more modern is men and hair. If I walk over to one of you and I pluck a hair from your head, are you bald? Most people say no. Okay, so then I pluck a second one and I take a third one, and a fourth one, and a fifth one, and if I keep going, you can see where this ends up. How many hairs do I need to pluck before you're bald? The original Sorites paradox was referring to the notion of grains of sand. If I put one grain of sand on a table, do I have a heap? If I put two, if I put three, four, five, how many grains of sand does it take to make a heap of sand? What is a heap? How big is it? Is it a unit of measure? Is it just an abstract discussion? What is it exactly? And why do we have a hard time figuring out where that cutting off point is? See, in software, we have binary. It either is or it isn't. A man is either has hair or he is bald. The end. But if I start taking hairs off of your head, where do we make that Boolean switch? We don't in software, we don't know how to deal with some of these problems particularly effectively. And so this remains, very bluntly, an unanswerable question for right now. But it's an important one to think about because there are going to be some situations when we start working with people, when we start working with problems, where we have to start thinking about here is an individual atom that becomes part of a larger group. When does that atom become a part of the group and when do we start referring to the group by its collective phrase? One of the most popular philosophical arguments is those of Zeno's paradoxes. You may have heard of these. The god Apollo and a turtle are going to have a race. Now, if you're not up on your Greek mythology, you may not be aware that the god Apollo was actually responsible for jumping in the chariot and pulling the sun across the sky. He's pretty fast. He's not as fast as Hermes, the god of speed, but he's pretty fast. By all rights and measures, he should be able to beat a turtle because those are generally pretty slow. So the Apollo gives the turtle a huge head start. It says, go, go, run, get to the end as fast as you can, and then makes up half the distance between himself and the turtle every second, every, every time unit we care to measure. And therefore, he can never catch the turtle. 
because he's only covering half the distance each time, and therefore he will never actually reach the turtle. Now, Zeno was not an idiot. He knew very well that if you actually sat the two down and ran a race, you would in fact watch the god run right past the turtle, no question. But when you look at this argument and you say, where is the logical flaw here? And it's really hard to find one. You realize that just logic and reason doesn't get you everywhere. There's a similar paradox. If I take a bow and arrow and I loosen the arrow from the bow and it flies through the air, at any given single moment in time, if we could pause time, if we could hit the pause button on the simulation that is life, we would see the arrow is just not moving. It's just sitting there. And so the question is, how does the arrow actually jump from one moment in time to the next? It's not really moving. It's just somehow changing position. Odd paradox. You may have heard of some of the philosophers, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, etc. Those are the big three in the philosophical world. But there's an interesting guy by the name of Xenophanes, who was uh, basically born in Colophon in the Greek Isles. He was exiled to southern Italy. And he was actually sort of a proto-philosopher. He was the first one to start thinking about, let's make arguments, but let's actually look at evidence. Let's look at what we see in front of us. And more importantly, he started thinking about thought. He started, started thinking about knowledge. He posited that gods are a reflection of the culture that worships them. We see the gods as a reflection of ourselves, which, you know, that, that seems relatively reasonable, especially if you do an anthropological study and look at a bunch of the cultures around the world. He also speculated that the natural nature of the universe was mud. From mud we are born, to mud we will return. Everything is basically returning to its muddy state. He spotted a couple of fossils, is what we think happened, and so he assumed that the dinosaurs, they went through one cycle of life, returned to the mud, and then humans sprang up out of that. All right, he may not pass physical science. But one of the things Xenophanes pointed out is that when you say that you know something, what you really have is a true belief. So, for example, if somebody stands up here and says, TDD is the best way to deliver quality software. Absolutely believes that. That is a true belief. That is not a fact. That is a true belief. You have that tattooed on your heart, at least that particular speaker does. Now, if we actually change the notion of what we know to what we think we know, this opens up a whole interesting dimension of how we approach problems. He maintained that there was such a thing as a truth of reality, but that in fact that reality was too difficult for any one person to understand. It's beyond human understanding. What you have is a belief in terms of how the world should work. What you have is a belief that test-driven development will in fact yield better results than anything else you've ever seen. And so what he posited is that once you have a true belief, it is your responsibility to seek to falsify that. If you have a true belief that TDD will yield the best possible results, how would you know if you are wrong? What evidence would you accept? What would lead you to conclude that that statement was not, in fact, a correct one? Is there any evidence and this is the thing that gets so fascinating when you start talking to people about their various positions. If you talk to somebody who says, I firmly believe that human beings should have the right to own guns and shoot other people. Okay, that's great. What would lead you to question that belief? And they would say, absolutely nothing. I totally believe this. This is absolutely unshakable. A, that tells you it's a very, very quick way to get out of a conversation. Because if you know that you can't convince somebody elsewise, why bother? There's no point in having the conversation anymore. But then you say, okay, great, give me your gun, I'm going to shoot you. And usually they'll change their mind at that point. So then it turns out there is some evidence that would lead them to actually question their original assumption. This notion of true belief is really, really important to us in software because 
when we have a true belief around something in software, particularly if it's something technical, we can actually do things to try to verify it or not. We call them benchmarks. I believe that Java is faster than .NET. Great, how would we be able to prove otherwise? Well, if we ran a benchmark and it showed that .NET was faster than Java, then obviously my belief would no longer hold. Okay, let's write that benchmark. And then if it turns out Java is faster than .NET, great, we've actually got a hypothesis that holds until we start verifying it in other ways because it turns out we wrote the benchmark badly or it turns out that the benchmark wasn't fair or et cetera, et cetera. This notion of falsification is absolutely crucial particularly to the thing that we call science. The other path that I mentioned is psychology, the study of the mind and behavior. Human mind and its functions, especially those affecting behavior inside of a given context, mental characteristics or attitude of a person or group, that's like the Wikipedia definition of psychology. Again, five main perspectives, biological, learning, cognitive, sociocultural, and psychodynamic. Again, psychology is every bit as large of a space as philosophy is. And psychology is, contrary to philosophy, psychology is trying to be a science. They are looking for repeatable deterministic experiments to try to ascertain things about basically how the brain works. Now, one of the problems that we run into is there are a lot of things out there that people posit as psychology that turns out absolutely not to be the case. For example, how many of you have ever heard that opposites attract? That people who are entirely unlike each other will in fact be very attracted to one another and they will live happily ever after. This is a very common theme. It turns out to be entirely wrong based on actual studies people have done. There's safety in numbers. Remember this when you go out into Krakow tonight and you start drinking and you're thinking, hey, I'm with a group of like 100 people what could possibly go wrong? It actually turns out that 100 people will, if you get mugged, 100 people will stand there and then start taking videos. If you want to be safe, if you want to actually get the crowd to help you, single out an individual. Hey, you in the blue shirt, come here, help me, I'm being mugged. Because now he has to explicitly refuse you as opposed to just sort of hiding in the anonymous mob that's watching you get mugged. These myths persist. Most people hold them to be self-evident. Most people will tell you, these are absolutely true. I know somebody that that's did this thing and it was totally true. And in fact, if you start drilling into the science in psychology, they will show you that all of those are in fact wrong. There is a book where a lot of this is coming from that says 50 great psychological myths. We only use 10% of our brain capacity if we are angry, it's better to express the anger than to hold it in. Actually, that's not true. If you get into a habit of being angry and hitting things, guess what's going to happen to the next time you're angry? You'll hit something, whether or not it's your punching bag or not. People tend to act strangely during a full moon. Nope. Completely verifiably false. Statistically speaking, you may remember people being crazy during a full moon better but there's actually no influence on human behavior from a celestial object that's several thousand miles away. Why do we believe in these? Because I believe very bluntly that there are several psychomythological facts as well, such as, for example, object relational mapping utilities are better than writing SQL directly. I'm fully, fully believe that's a complete myth. In some cases, we are misled by supposed experts, people who will wear headgear like this and stand on stage and tell you things. And quite frankly, we're accustomed to listening to people on stage. We are accustomed to saying, oh, well, you must be the expert. You must know better than I. When somebody stands up here and says, Erlang is an amazing language and you can totally get everything done faster than you've ever seen before. If only you embrace the functional mindset, you go, uh-huh. Great, Erlang, next project, got it, check. There's a talk show host, Dr. Phil. He loves to bring people on stage, people who have problems, right? He loves to bring them on stage and put a lie detector, right? They hook you up to this device that measure all of your biological responses when people ask you questions and whatnot. 
Lie detectors have been proven to, in fact, not work. They can measure certain biometric responses, but in fact, it's very easy to fool a lie detector. This has been done repeatedly in several studies at several universities over the world. And yet, Dr. Phil, if he did it, it must be true. Because he's got doctor in his name. So he must know something that I don't. In some cases, the people, the authors, the speakers, will get some of the science wrong. If I misrepresent a particular study, you'll go away believing that misrepresentation of the study is the correct one. Or I'll only explain parts of it. Or you will only hold on to the simplest parts of it. Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil must have doctor in my name in order to be believed. Got it. Because there's a lot of complexities that, that happen in some of these things. In some cases, we believe we are the experts. I write software for a living. What could you possibly know that I don't with respect to how to set the clock on the VCR? We actually have, at, at, at my home, um, we have a media set up, you know, both in my wife's and I bedroom, as well as the gaming console that the boys use for watching stuff and playing games and so forth, and I have no idea how any of it works. None whatsoever. And friends frequently find this hilarious. They're like, but you're like this big Uber, Uber software geek. I'm like, yeah, I could write the software for the thing, but then there's cables involved. <laughs> and, you know, I, that's a hardware problem. We will sometimes get ourselves into this mind space that says we are smart people. We are software developers. We deal with all these abstractions. Therefore, we must understand how the patent system works. We must understand law. We know better than anybody else how something should work because we are software developers. So let me tell you how you should behave at work the next time your boss does something to piss you off. Because your boss and psychological behavior is exactly like garbage collection in a JVM. This is called hubris and we are extremely vulnerable to it. In some cases, the science is close enough. This is a tricky part. Ulcers caused by the body's reaction to stress. This was a fact for any number of years in medicine, that if you had a stomach ulcer, it was because you were leading too stressful a life and you needed to relax. The prescription was, Go to a beach and have Mai Tais served to you by beautiful members of your preferred sex. That's how you defeat an ulcer. There is no medical cure. There is no pill. It's just, you just have to relax, chill out. And if your ulcer isn't going away, it's because you're not relaxing enough. So come on, man. Start relaxing more. Why aren't you relaxing? Relax more or you're going to die. <laughs> Two Australian researchers discovered something very interesting. In an environment, the human stomach, where it was widely believed that no bacterium could ever survive, they discovered a bacterium. And more importantly, they discovered that Helobacter pylori not only survives, but they can be treated by antibiotics. And that these helobacter priori are actually what causes the ulcer. Really doesn't have much to do with stress at all. Although, quite frankly, if the doctor writes a prescription that I have to go to a tropical island and have Mai Tais served by beautiful women, yes, I absolutely, I will fill this one right now. I am on the next plane to Tahiti. The fascinating thing about this story those two guys discovered it within the last 15 years, but the bacterium has been known. You can see papers mentioning it all the way back to the 1950s. Doctors, medical experts, held this belief that the stomach was a place where no bacterium could survive, even though the evidence was there that suggested it could. Sometimes the science is close enough and it seems to explain the problem, but it doesn't really explain it entirely. 
Here's the worst part. Sometimes the science contradicts common sense. And this is where we in particular, that hubris, comes in major, major play. We sometimes interpret things incorrectly. We read the world around us wrong. And we say, but we're really smart people. We make livings with our brains. I believe that because I understand how to debug a software program, I understand human behavior, and therefore I can interpret things correctly. This is in many cases the source of frustration for a lot of the women who are in technology because women will say, oh, I have this boss and he's always on my case. And us men will stand up and say, oh, well, what you should do is, because we understand what it's like to be a woman in technology, right? But it's common sense. If you just stand up and say the man's an idiot, he'll believe you and then you can make a piece and continue on with your job. Yeah, that may have worked for you, and it may feel like common sense to you, but it doesn't always work in every case. But try to convince somebody that their common sense is wrong. There are a whole bunch of people that will, in fact, tell you that common sense is more important than science. Dennis Prager, there are two kinds of studies in the world, those that confirm our common sense and those that are wrong. Interesting little tidbit. Quote, women are less intelligent than men. End quote. Who said that? Aristotle. Aristotle said that. To him it was common sense. And because it was Aristotle who said that, people believed it for thousands of years. As a matter of fact, there's a great story dating back to the Middle Ages during the start of the Enlightenment period where they were just beginning to discover medical science. And somebody basically had taken a cadaver, a body, opened it up and was pointing out all of the various organs and how things were working because this was a recently de uh, deceased body. And this famous medical expert at the time looking at the body, hearing somebody explain to him how I think it was the digestive tract worked, he said, I am fully inclined to believe you were it not that Aristotle said the opposite. This guy in a toga believed that digestion, that emotions came from the heart. That was another Aristotelian statement. And therefore, because it made common sense, right? When you're nervous, your heart flutters, you get those butterflies in your stomach. Clearly, this is the emotional center Emotions don't come from here. Logic and reason comes from here. Emotions come from here. Total common sense. So therefore, it must be true. There's a whole bunch of them that we've seen over the years. Phrenology can determine your personality. This was a popular one in the 1900s. We can read the bumps on your head because that's actually distended parts of your brain. And the shape of your brain determines your personality. People would go to festivals and somebody would like feel your head and say, oh, you're very wise. And people will go, yeah, of course. They're like fortune tellers. Fortune tellers will sit and talk to you for a while and they'll say, so what are you trying to do? Well, I'd like to get a hold of my dead relative. And the fortune teller says, ah, yes, your relative is, let's see, it was somebody I think on the male side of the family. And based on the body language, they'll respond to that and say, yes, 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 it was a, a male member of your family. You watch fortune tellers at work, and they're just really, really good at reading human reaction. They have no skill whatsoever. They're just reading all of this stuff. We have years and years and years of this uncommon sense that we're trying to sort our way through in so many ways. Nothing could be more obvious than that the earth is stable and unmoving, and that we are the center of the universe. Modern Western science takes its beginning from a denial of this common sense axiom. When we started to stop thinking about a Earth-centric universe, we started to discover astronomy. And that led us all the way to the point where we have now successfully put human beings into space for long periods of time. And we have started taking the very basic steps towards perhaps getting off this planet and stretching out into the stars. But it began with an acceptance that the common sense perception, because as I stand here, I don't feel like I'm moving. I don't feel like I'm going anywhere. 
Common sense tells me that this is the center of the universe. As I stand and look at the stars, boy, there's a lot of them, but it sure feels like I'm at the center of a circle. Once we got past that common sense axiom, once we started looking at Xenophanes and the notion of I have a true belief as opposed to I know, then progress could be made. Doesn't mean common sense is all wrong. Doesn't mean that you should completely distrust all of your senses. If you look at the stove and it is glowing red, yes, it's probably hot. You don't need to touch it to verify. But we do need to treat common sense with a degree of skepticism. If you're sitting in a meeting and somebody says, everybody knows Agile works better, your first response is, who's everybody? How do they know? What actual evidence do we have to support or disprove their belief? To a certain degree, you can ask, what, 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 so, so people believe in a few folk tales. Who cares, right? I mean, memory is like videotape back here. When you see something, when you remember something, it's playing these recordings that are stored somewhere in the back of your head. When you go to the office next week, and you start talking to people about this crazy presentation about psychology and philosophy and whatever the hell that was, you're gonna remember portions of this as if it were playing out as a video inside your head, right? That's actually not at all what happens. We store little bits of fact back here, and then when you are remembering a particular scene or a particular event, you are, in fact, reconstructing the image in your head based on the facts that you have. We've seen this over and over and over in a variety of different studies. As a matter of fact, there was this terrible outbreak of what was called repressed memories, where small children who were in therapy all of a sudden came back with accusations against their parents of sexual abuse. These memories were somehow suppressed and now through active therapy they were brought back and it turns out that all the evidence suggested that there was no such abuse that ever took place. And as a matter of fact, when people examined what these psychologists, these therapists had done, they had implanted the seeds. Don't you remember that time when you were in your room and somebody came in the door and did those terrible, don't you remember that? And you start thinking and you start going, yeah, you know, maybe, kind of, sort of, I can see it happening. This is the danger of a lot of the cycle myths, is if we start believing in some of this stuff, we start making some terrible decisions. If you are on a jury and you see a video of a particular person in the street and you happened to watch the event, are you absolutely certain that the two will agree? Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you that there are details that your memory forgets that the video does not. Yes, we all know about Photoshop and it's amazing what we can do with CGI. But there are ways to detect tampering in video as well. But even so, the possibility of tampering on a video is still more truthful than what you remember, and boy, is that hard to swallow. That's really, really hard to accept. We all believe that we are rational actors. When you stand in front of the counter and you think, do I want the healthy sandwich or do I want the ice cream cone? We like to think that what we're doing is we're engaging in an internal discussion, an internal debate that says, let's weigh the possible costs of having to work the ice cream off later versus eating the healthy sandwich, which will have some perhaps nebulous benefit on our health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Truth is, fMRI studies have shown brain activity. When somebody is presented with a decision, the emotional centers fire first, and then the logic centers fire. What's happening is you decide and then you look for reasons why this must be true. You laugh, but we've seen it play out any number of ways. And again, 
the electrical impulse studies. I mean, we can see the electricity firing inside your head. You decide, and then you go to logic. You have made that decision. Which means that if you don't realize that, if you believe that you're a rational actor, if you believe that you always make your decisions based on logic, you will believe that all of your decisions were based on logic. You must have a good reason for why you think this way. You, you must. You're, you're, you're a rational individual. You're not irrational. That's what the unwashed masses do. The people who are not as intelligent, educated, well-off, etc., those other folks, they don't think clearly, but me, I think good. Knowledge is power. Ignorance is powerlessness. So here the knowledge is that you don't actually think the way you think you think. Got that? How do we bust this stuff in terms of psychology and psychomythology? There are 10 common cognitive biases that we're all vulnerable to. One is word of mouth, urban myths, right? The, the urban myth, for example, that Ruby is slower than Java. We've all heard it, it's been said, or that Java is slower than C. If you want really fast code, you should write it in C because everybody knows that an interpreted language cannot possibly be as fast as a compiled one. Well, where did we hear that? Oh, it's just been around for forever. It's an urban myth. In some cases, what we want is an easy answer, a quick fix. Okay, boss, I'm gonna go work on this really, really hard and complex project, and I have no idea how to get started. Where do I go? What do I do? I know, I'm gonna to go to that conference in Krakow, and I'm gonna stand there and listen to people, and somebody's gonna stand up here, and he's gonna say, go to the cloud. Okay, beautiful, awesome, I know what to do now. I'm gonna to go to the cloud. Quick, easy, and I don't have to think about it anymore because it turns out that the amygdala, these lizard brain portions of the brain, they don't like uncertainty. They, they treat uncertainty with the same degree that they treat a dangerous predator. They get into a threat response. You're really jittery, you're really nervous. You feel stress when you don't have an answer to something. And if somebody comes up to you and says, I have a super quick fix, all you have to do is hire me, and I will make all your problems go away. And this is how IBM makes a living. This is how every consulting company makes a living. Don't stress, CEO, oh, come on, you're so tense. Just sit down, let me give you a neck rub, we'll play a little golf, we'll take care of this hard stuff for you. Quick, easy fix, done. We remember things selectively, we infer causation from correlation, we use post hoc or go propter hoc reasoning. Well, because that project was successful, it must mean that agile is a key to success. We're seeing this all the time right now in startups. There's a huge startup community in the Seattle area and everybody is really, really, really gung-ho on the whole notion of the lean startup. The lean startup is the one that spends its money on the important things and doesn't spend its money on trivialities. It's focused on delivering a minimum viable product because somebody did that once and their startup was successful. So therefore, we must do that. Because we're inferring that because you did this and you were successful, therefore, that must have been the reason that did it. Because somebody used Hibernate, on a project, it must have been the success to the project. Exposure to a biased sample. One project used Hibernate, it was successful, case closed. Okay, well what if we extend this to five, 10, 20, 100 projects that used Hibernate, or any other technology? I pick on Hibernate just because it's fun. Or Pearl, Pearl is even more fun. Reasoning by representativeness, just some heuristics it's really easy to pick on Pearl because, yeah, it's representative of this group of people that are all suspender-wearing, beards, eunuchs. They've been around for a thousand years. Nobody really understands what they're doing. Yeah, all Pearl must suck. Misleading film and media portrayals the day Pearl was in the movies and it was actually the killer in the movie, Mr. Okay, I'm really stretching the analogy there, but Exaggeration of a kernel of truth. I wouldn't do that to Pearl, would I? 
I might misrepresent Pearl as hard to read because there have been people who have written Pearl scripts that they could never read again, but I would never exaggerate that, would I? Nah. A little bit of fun facts about the brain. Highly energy constrained. Turns out that the brain between your ears runs in about 40 watts of power. Look up. Those lights, they are actually consuming more energy than you. You are, by definition, the dimmest bulb in this room. <laughs> and like most machines, the brain wants to do as much as possible with the constrained resources that it has. So it starts to take shortcuts. How many of you see a gray triangle at the center of this picture? Show of hands. Come on, it's all right. This is, a, this is a room. I mean, the fact that you're all idiots, notwithstanding. Because there is no gray triangle at the center of that picture. There are only three Pac-Men and three HTML tags. <laughs> How do I know this? Because I drew that picture. I drew that picture. I most certainly did not put a gray triangle there. It's a background. But your brain says, you know what, I look at that, I parse that, the quickest way to interpret that is as a triangle. So that's what we're going to run with. And that's what your brain, it's, you know, you can try to see it as three Pac-Man and three HTML tags, but it's really hard to look past the gray triangle there in the center, because that's what your brain really, really wants to do. It's like, boss, I have a solution. Just stop thinking about it. Perception is a matter of the brain, not the eyes. The eyes report data, the brain tells you what you're seeing. This is important. Everybody's familiar with this optical illusion, correct? When you look at this, when I ask you, are those two horizontal lines the same length? Many of you will say yes, they are in fact the same length because you're familiar with this optical illusion. You know that if you actually sit down and measure them, as a matter of fact, if you do the little finger thing, right? Yep, yep, they're pretty much the same length. And yet, your brain is telling you that the top one is longer than the bottom one. And as someone who's seen this optical illusion before, you know that it's just an optical illusion. But why? Why is it an optical illusion? What is your brain doing that makes you think that these lines are of different length? Well, it turns out it's all about perspective. You've all stood in the middle of the street and looked down the street and noticed how it looks like the sides of the street are coming together as you stare down the street. Or you've stood at the foot of a tall building and looked up and watched as the building seems to sort of slope in towards the top. Looks kind of like it's going to eventually come to a triangular point somewhere off in the distance. And then your experience says, well, if I walk down this street... Eventually, I will come to a point where I realize that they should be this close together, and they're not. What I'm really seeing is parallel lines appearing to converge in the distance. It's perspective. I get it. Your entire life has been spent reinforcing this image of two parallel lines appearing to converge in the distance, and therefore your brain says, got it, I know what this is, and reports it as two parallel lines such that now, since those horizontal lines have different distance from those supposedly parallel lines, it must mean, due to perspective, that that top line is much wider than the bottom one because it's off in the distance. And your brain does all of this in a fraction of a second. Now, the really easy way for you to figure out that this is what your brain is doing is to invert the picture. Can you tell now that those two horizontal lines are in fact the same length? It's a lot easier now because you don't have perspective. If you're standing on a street and the supposedly parallel lines look like that, something is wrong and you may want to seek medical attention. <laughs> Just saying. If you're standing at the base of a building and you look up and it slopes like that, you are probably dangling upside down over the Egyptian pyramids. I don't know what the hell's going on. Again, you probably want to seek help. 
What this anecdote tells you is that a large part of psychology, a large part of what's going on in your brain, is your brain seeking to understand the world around you in terms of patterns that it has, it has already seen before. It is already parsing things. It is already picking up on hints, habits, etc. You are perceiving the world around you in a manner consistent with your past experience. Your brain is learning lessons even if you don't consciously apply them. When I show you this diagram, what do you see? You see your project. And the best part of it is, I don't even have to know anything about your project to know that you used this diagram to describe it. Because this, ladies and gentlemen, is the universal software architecture diagram. Box, arrow, box, arrow, cylinder. Works for everything. Seriously, this is what architects get paid to do. <laughs> they sit around in a room, they drink beer, and then they're like, oh, oh, we have presentation in 10 minutes. Fuck, right, box, arrow, box, arrow, cylinder. Oh, whew, glad we got that out of way. Pour me more beer. <laughs> this diagram, by the way, works as far back as the 1960s. In the 1990s, this was operating system talking to database, talking to storage. In the 2000s, this was web browser talking to web server, talking to database. In the 2010s, this is mobile device talking to API server, talking to database. You think I'm joking, I'm really not. It is the universal software architecture diagram. And so what happens when you walk into a room at the new project and you see that on the board, your brain goes, I know what that is. I've done that before. That's C++ talking to Oracle, talking to some storage. I totally know what these guys are working on. This is awesome. I'm going to be able to so kill it on this project. And they're like, so we have a mobile device. And you're like, and it's written in C++. They're like, no, no, no. Your brain is interpreting what it sees in front of you in a manner consistent with your experience. So when you walk into a new project and you start seeing things that look familiar to your old project, you assume this is just like your old project. Now we're back into the realm of psychology again. Perception. The actual stimuli that comes, the actual stimuli that's happening in terms of the things around you is not where the actual uh, story is. That's all inside your head. Gestalt was a school of thought originating in Germany that said basically we organize everything into patterns and forms. We look at everything as this set of patterns and this set of forms. And patterns, if only the gang of four had known about Gestalt, they might have found a few more patterns that they could, di that they could diagram and sell. When you start talking about some of the psychological principles, Gestalt talks about figure and ground, proximity, closure, etc. This is all about perception directly on the brain itself in terms of eyesight, hearing, etc. Similarity, continuity, simplicity. We will seek to simplify certain diagrams so that we can perceive it better. We will seek to look and group things similarly together. The gestalt is what was causing that gray triangle to show up because continuity was kicking in. If I go back far enough here to here, continuity is the effort that says, look, I can see that the lower left Pac-Man has a, vertical, or a diagonal line here and it sort of appears, and look, it's met by a diagonal line up there. Continuity is what fills in the rest of this for you. Some of this happens in terms of when we start doing interviews and when we start talking on projects and so on and so forth. There's some other interesting psychological stuff here around binocular cues, right? The fact that the eyes are a few inches apart means we can actually see in depth. Modern motion parallax, that's how we actually perceive motion, relative size, clarity, gradient, linear perspective, light and shadow. This is all of the biological part of psychology, the actual perception of how we get stuff into the brain back here. Bunch more of this stuff, wow. 
Selective attention. Anybody notice that there was a gorilla standing in the back of the room back there about 10 minutes ago? Yeah, there really wasn't. But there is a fascinating study where, in fact, if you Google the phrase, gorillas in our midst, there's a YouTube video of an experiment that was done by a couple of researchers where they bring out a group of basketball players and they want you to count the passes. They want you to count the number of times a ball leaves a white player's hand and is caught by that same player. And in the middle of this video, while you're trying to count the passes, somebody dressed in a gorilla suit walks out into the middle of this and then walks off. You're laughing, but it's a real study. Psychologists get paid for this sort of thing. That's, that's the real funny part about all of this. Half the people, when they conducted this study, half the people didn't notice the gorilla. Because your brain has this incredible ability to hone in on stuff and just sort of ignore the context around it in a lot of ways. Okay. I've wandered around a lot. I've talked about philosophy, I've talked about psychology, and in some respects, you're probably thinking, okay, dude, you have a point, right? There's, this is actually going to come to some sort of conclusion. You're going to tie this all together in a bright red bow, etc. I am. I hope. I think. Maybe. Yeah. There's two topics that I think are interesting to us today, particularly people in this room. One is interviews. How many of you really, really thoroughly enjoy standing at a whiteboard trying to explain binary trees using nothing more than a whiteboard marker. I see no hands going up. And yet, that seems to be one of the most popular ways for us to interview an individual to determine whether or not they're suitable for working on this team. And the question that I've been asking for a number of years, which now thankfully seems to be getting picked up, is how do we know, this is where the philosopher in me kicks in, how do we know that that actually works? I've actually had this conversation with uh, some of the managers at my company where I'm working right now. How do we know that this works? And one of them says, well, you know, we, 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 we don't hire bad programmers. Okay, what would define a bad programmer? Somebody who doesn't know how to write code? And how do you know that the person who's standing up there at the board explaining a binary tree actually knows how to write code? I mean, that's just explaining a binary tree. Most of the time when you do these whiteboard interviews, you're asking people to write in pseudocode anyway. How do we know that this is working? What evidence do we have? How would we falsify this particular hypothesis? Let's start with the basic question. What is an interview designed to do? Well, an interview is designed to determine whether or not this individual is uh, capable of working at this company. Based on what? Because if the job here is going to be to be a HTML web front-end developer, then asking them to do a binary tree is a terrible way of predicting their abilities. And we should be asking them to actually demonstrate the skills that they have as opposed to trying to solve arbitrarily compu arbitrary computer science problems that most people learned in university and never actually picked up and used again. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if I need a binary tree, I go grab one from somebody else. I go to that great omniscient computer science god in the sky and I say, Google, binary tree Java. Perfect. I'm just going to grab that. Or we just get it out of Maven Central or etc. So why exactly is this somehow a telling representation as to whether or not somebody will actually be able to work here. Google, interestingly enough, did a study not too long ago where internally they started tracking the success of candidates, the success in the interview versus success on the job over, I think, a two-year span after the interview. Degree of correlation they found, statistically zero. This is Google. This is the company with those really, really interesting intellectual, uh, you know, fascinating problems, computer science puzzles, blah, blah, blah. Statistically, zero correlation between their really, really highly thought of interview process and actual success on the job. 
There is an interesting study that came out of the United States a couple of years ago where they took a number of resumes, the same resume, and they submitted it through the process. This is the first attempt I've seen to anybody actually trying to unit test an interview process to see what results. You laugh, but how would you unit test your interview process to determine whether or not it's actually yielding candidates of known quantity? I mean, this is what we do. If we want to introduce determinism into an otherwise non-deterministic thing, we have to start somewhere. How would you unit test your interview process? In this particular case, they took resumes and they were determining whether or not a resume would get a callback. The number one criteria for determining whether or not a resume got a callback, anybody want to guess what it was? The name. The name. If it was a traditionally, now the study was coming out of America, so if it was a traditionally white American name, chances of callback were 50, 60% higher than if it was something like Lakeisha. The name. It's a little disturbing, don't you think? And part of this is because the brain back here, it prefers the familiar. Homophily is what it's called in psychological terms. When I look across the table and I see somebody who looks a lot like me, I feel a lot more comfortable than if I see somebody who's of a different race, different gender, different age, the whole nine yards. And it's really easy to explain away, because remember, we make decisions emotionally. Well, we didn't hire that candidate, not because she was a black female, but because it wasn't a good culture fit. If your company is turning people away because of culture fit, there is a strong chance that they are turning people away because they are not just like you. Despite the fact that companies have determined, this is, there have been several studies that have since emerged in the psychology space that say companies that are diverse actually have better revenue. They actually yield like 45% better rates of return for the company over the same period of time as those which are not diverse. And companies that have somebody on staff who is of similar demographic to clients end up doing like 170% better on customer service studies. In other words, if you have a diverse staff, you will better relate to all the various customers that are out there in the world that might want to give you money. So if we were going to start thinking about interview processes from a philosophical and psychological perspective, philosophy says, let's ask the questions. How do we get a better interview process? Psychology says, what do we know that's going on inside the brain that would hinder our interview process? The other place that's really interesting is in the last couple of weeks, we've seen something very interesting happen in the Java space. That is to say, there was a concerted political lobbying effort to deny the release of Java 9. I'm not going to get into the technical merits of the discussion because, quite frankly, I don't know. I don't really, I haven't been tracking the whole JPMS system. I haven't been tracking Jigsaw. I was a part of the Jigsaw JSR back in its first incarnation, like five, eight, whatever years ago, but I haven't been following it closely ever since. We do know that we want to have some kind of package system for Java. I think everybody agrees on that. But the fascinating thing for me is, if this is the Java community process, if this is something that the community is supposed to be driving and the community is supposed to be owning, why does it seem that most JSRs are run by vendors? How many of you are members of the Java community process? You sit on a JSR, you're a, you're a Java expert. No hands go up in the room that I can see. So why is it called the Java community process? And interesting little tidbit, Oracle, when they bought Sun, they inherited certain rights in the Java community process, including the ability to set aside a particular vote if necessary, where necessary is defined as because we feel like it. This doesn't strike me as really a democracy. This strikes me more as, well, more like a people's republic. 
You vote, if we like vote, we, we celebrate vote. If we don't like vote, you didn't vote. Now, interesting question. Is that how you want to be governed? Because we are talking about governance here. We are talking very firmly about political philosophy at this point. We are talking about what should your relationship to the powers that be that govern something that's very important to you, that is to say the further technological advancement of the Java virtual machine, which many, if not most of you, depend on for a living. Is this the way you want it to work? Is this the way it should work? Is this the way that if Oracle were to say, you know what, we're going to set all of this aside and we're just going to keep going forward with Java 9 and to hell with what the folks at JBoss think, or IBM or Red Hat or whoever it was that argued. We don't care what they think. They're actually a competitor of ours. And so, yeah, as a matter of fact, interesting little tidbit, Plato was never a big fan of democracy. Plato, the great philosopher, believed very strongly that States should be governed by what he called the philosopher king, somebody who is well-reasoned, somebody who is well-educated, somebody who governs by virtue of his knowledge. And if we're talking about people who have the best knowledge of the platform, to a certain degree you can argue that that's the people who are building it, that is to say Oracle themselves. This is arguing in many respects for a benevolent dictator. Are we okay with that? Is that what we're, is that the way we want to see this happen? Yeah. I don't have answers. I'm not going to pretend to have answers. Because in some cases, even if I did have the answers, it wouldn't matter unless all of you agreed with me and we staged some kind of protest outside Oracle headquarters. Free the JCP now. But the fact that we as a community don't really spend much time thinking about some of these things in many cases, it just happens over there in the corner, and occasionally it makes news on, you know, Hacker News, or it'll show up on DZone or InfoQ, and we go, oh, Java 9's not shipping for another three months, whatever. Or, what do you mean it's not shipping for another three months? We were ready to go into production, and they're actually going to change the way modules work, and we were banking on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the political philosophers would say, what is the relationship between the governed and the governors at Oracle. Psychology and philosophy deal with a lot of these problems that we as programmers have to deal with, both in terms of the way we think and the way we reason about things, the way we view the world, the way we approach the world, the way in which we rationalize the world, etc. I'm not going to promise that if you study philosophy you will immediately become a better programmer. What I am going to promise is that if you study philosophy, you will in fact never look at the world the same way. You will find yourself filled with questions, and you will ask these questions. And in many cases, you will be the most annoying friend that your friends have. Believe me, my family can attest to this. But in many cases, the questions that you might ask are important questions that need to be asked, and if you don't ask them, nobody will. Because that's another psychological principle. It's really easy to just run with the herd. Everybody else must know something that I don't. Otherwise, why wouldn't they be asking this question? Because in many cases, they're afraid. They're afraid to be that person in the room. They're afraid to be the annoying one. They're afraid to be the one that's always asking those stupid, annoying questions. They're afraid to be the one that's challenging the status quo. Everybody knows that Agile is better. Why is it better, asks the philosopher. And the psychologist says, let's start standing up some experiments to find out. That's all I got for you. Peace.